Hi, and welcome to Hopkins at Home. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jeremy Brown. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about touch and how we can use our knowledge and understanding of touch to engineer novel touch interactions and touch sensations in everyday electronic and robotic interfaces. I'm gonna start with a high level overview of what touch is and how it works from a very practical and biological uh, perspective, and then move on to touch as a research topic and talk about fundamental work uh, that my lab is doing in investigating touch perception and how touch perception works, and then applying that knowledge in the design of touch interfaces for robotic devices, such as upper limb prostheses and surgical robots. I encourage you to ask questions throughout the talk using the chat feature, and I will allow a lot ample time at the end of this discussion to address any and all questions that arise. So to get started, let's start with the obvious question. What is touch? So I think many of us know that touch is one of our five senses, right? We can smell, we can see, we can hear, we can taste, and of course, we can touch. Anytime we interact with the world around us, we use touch. Touch is integral and essential to how we coordinate the movement and actions of our body, um, how we perform activities of daily living, how we greet other people, um, and basically how we get around in the world around us. Um, you know, as an example, you can take the pictures here showing different ways in which touch is used to accomplish different tasks, whether that be for work, for leisure, um, whether, you know, right now you're sitting at a computer and typing, drinking from a cup of coffee, um, you know, touch is essential and really important in everything uh, that we do. Another way that we've actually learned to appreciate and come to understand the importance of touch has to do with the recent COVID-19 pandemic, where, you know, under the guidance of healthcare providers and healthcare officials, we've been practicing social distancing. I mean, this social distancing has actually forced us to move physically away from each other and therefore not touch. So many of the handshakes, high fives and hugs and things that we've you know, been used to pre-pandemic, we're actually learning to live in a world where those aren't the common social norms anymore. Um, and especially when we think about the limitations that were placed on travel, where we couldn't go meet and spend time with family and friends and loved ones, that touch interaction has been largely absent uh, and largely missing. Now, when we think about touch uh, and compare touch to maybe two of our other senses, seeing and hearing, touch is drastically different. So let's think about sight and let's think about hearing. Both sight and hearing are what we call centralized sensations uh, or centralized senses, being that everything that we can see and everything that we hear comes from really two sets of sensors, our eyes for seeing and our ears for hearing. Um, the senses are also very broad. Everything that we want to see, we see with our eyes, whether it be color or motion or depth. Everything that we want to hear, we hear with our ears. Um, tone, pitch, timbre. Um, you know, both of these senses are also very passive. I could sit here and not move my head and still see what's going on, at least right in front of me. I um, mean, if you're staring at the screen right now, you might see my hand passing in front of you. You didn't actually have to move in order to see that or notice that information. Likewise, if I'm sitting on, a, let's say, a busy crowded street or on a bus or something like that, I can hear the motion of things going on around me, right? I know that a car just passed or I know that a person is approaching from behind because I can hear those footsteps. I don't actually have to turn around to actively explore to be able to hear or to be able to see. Touch and hearing are also very, uh, are also very cognitive. Right, Everything that we see, everything that we hear, we actually have to tie it to prior experience. Right, When I see a pen or a cup of coffee, I recognize that as a pen or a cup of coffee because I've seen them before. And when I recognize that object in my visual field, I tie it back to things that I've seen that look just like that. The same thing with hearing. Right? If I hear an alarm going off, I listen to the alarm and I said, oh, that alarm sounds like a fire alarm because I've heard a fire alarm before. And so that's kind of unique to both seeing and hearing. Now, when we think about touch, touch is drastically different. Touch is distributed. Everywhere that we have skin, muscles, and joints, we have touch sensors. Touch is also very narrow. Each of the sensors that we have specialize in on measuring a specific aspect of touch. 
You compare that back to our, let's say, eyes and our ears that can hear and see everything. Each of our touch sensors can only sense a you know, very small range of all that there is in terms of touch sensation. Touch is also very active. And by that, I mean, we have to physically explore the world in order to touch it, right? I can't feel the keyboard in front of me unless I reach out and actually touch the keyboard. I can't feel the piece of fabric or I can't feel the weight of the cup of coffee unless I reach out and grab it or touch it or pick it up and manipulate it. And so by, for that, we say touch is a very physical sense um, in that we're physically manipulating and physically interacting with the world to get touch information. So I talked a lot about the word touch. In the research context, we often refer to touch by another name called haptics. Haptic is from the Greek word haptique, and it means relating to the sense of touch, in particular perception in, in, in regards to manipulation of objects um, for, you know, moving and manipulating things around. So I'm going to start referring to the word haptic here kind of going forward, but anytime I say the word haptic, understand that haptic really just means touch sensation. And so our haptic senses, which I'll uh, talk about more in depth in a few slides, really, again, helps us coordinate the movements of our body, right? To pick up the cup of coffee in the picture here that you see, uh, to drink, to read the book and turn the pages, to type on the keyboard, all that requires tight coordination of our muscle actions. And that information uh, is enabled by and supplemented by our touch sensation. Touch also enables perception. Right? If I pick up a 10 pound weight or a five pound weight, I know which one is heavier because I perceive the weight of the object through my touch sensors. Even though we may not talk about touch all the time, um, we actually use what we call haptic metaphors in our every, everyday experience, right? These metaphors relate to things like emotion, like that was a touching speech that someone gave, relate to haptic exploration, right? Let's get a feel for this. Um, they relate to making contact with things, right? Let's touch base. Let's keep in touch. They relate to the way in which we constrain and manipulate things, right? Get a grip or, uh, you know, that was a very pushy way of, of, of doing something. Um, and then also, of course, uh, the surface properties of objects, right? Oh, we're in a sticky situation right now. Um, and so it's interesting that even though we may not think about touch all the time, we're actually using very, you know, touched, charged words kind of in our everyday lexicon. Another uh, term that I want to uh, introduce to you is uh, the term tactual stereognosis. Now, tactual comes from the word tactile, which is really relating to the sense of touch. And we'll talk about what tactile actually means um, in a couple of slides. But think of it now as just, you know, meaning via the sense of touch. Stereognosis is really our mental ability to perceive the three-dimensionality of an object via our senses. And so when you put these two terms together, what it basically means is that we can recognize an object's three-dimensionality or we can recognize an object by our sense of touch. Um, and, and this is something that everyone can do. And we're actually really good at it. In fact, some seminal work by uh, Roberta Klatsky in the mid 80s showed that People can identify over a hundred objects, right? Just by the sense of touch alone, without actually having to see it and only having to touch an object for an average of about two seconds. In fact, when I give my, uh, when I teach a class on haptics here at Hopkins, I often uh, pass around what I call the haptic box. And this box has different objects uh, that I've just kind of picked up around the way inside. And there's a little hole cut inside the top of the box. And I pass it around and I ask students, reach inside and see if you can identify two to three of the objects inside the box. And 100% of the time, by the end of class, the students collectively have been able to identify every single object in the box. And so that just goes to show how in, in uh, how adept we are at this form of tactile stereognosis and the ability to recognize the three dimensionality of objects and actually recognize the object itself by touch. And this is something you can actually try on your own, right? Have someone put three objects in front of you without you seeing and just reach out and explore those objects. And I bet you will at least be able to recognize half, if not all of the objects. And the reason we can do that is because we often use a common set of what are called haptic exploratory procedures to recognize different properties of the object. Right. If we go in a fabric shop and you want to feel the, the, the texture of an object, right, we're literally sliding our fingers over the surface of the object in order to recognize its texture. 
If we want to recognize the weight of an object, we're oftentimes picking it up and holding it. If you think back to the weight example I gave of lifting a 10 pound and a five pound weight, you basically hold it without support in order to recognize how heavy it is. If we want to, rec if we want to understand how hot or cold something is, we're touching it and leaving our hands there and allowing the temperature, what we call temperature differential, um, the difference between our body temperature and the temperature at the, at the contact of our skin to tell us whether an object is hot or whether an object is cold. And we all use these procedures. So again, the next time you go out and start touching objects in the world, think about these different procedures and see how many of them you're actually using, especially if you do that task that I talked about, the tactual stereognosis task in the last slide. What I'm showing here um, is actually called the sensory homunculus. And what the sensory homunculus, this um, uh, figure that you see on the left, um, it's an illustration of how our bodies would actually look if they were sized according to their representation in the brain. I mean, in particular, what we're looking at is called, and when we look at the somatosensory cortex in the brain, which is where all of our sensory information goes to in the brain, what we see is that a large portion of the real estate of our somatosensory cortex is actually given to our hands and our face. And that's where a lot of our touch sensation resides. There's a corollary which we call the you know, which uh, we call the motor homunculus, um, which exists for the motor cortex, um, which we think about our muscle action, where our muscles, um, the real estate that's given to the muscles um, in you know in our body, and it actually looks quite the same, a lot in our face and a lot in our hands. And so what you can see here is that basically we've got a, a outsized distribution of touch information coming from our hands and from our face. And in particular, when we look at, let's say, our, our hands and our arms, we'll see that the number of touch sensors actually differs in terms of its distribution. In our hands, we have a very, very dense coverage of sensors, especially at the fingertips um, and in the palmar region of our hand. Whereas in the rest of our arm, it's a little more sparse. And if you think about kind of how we interact in the real world, that makes a lot of sense, right? A lot of our physical interactions with the world actually come by means of reaching out with our hands and touching the objects in the world around us. And so it would make sense then that uh, the majority of our touch, touch sensors are actually located in our hands. Now, I do wanna take a minute and, and pause and talk a little bit about you know, the differences between what we call active and passive touch. Now, I know at the beginning, I said that touch is a very active sensation, but it is true that we can actively receive passive touch sensations. In fact, if I were giving this, this talk at home, I'd likely be in my office where my dog likes to come in and often rub up against my leg. And that's a form of passive touch. And what we notice is that there are differences between active and passive touch. When we actively touch the world around us, we're focusing in on the object. If you think about that tactual stereognosis that I talked about before, right, you're reaching out and you're trying to understand the characteristics and the properties of the physical world around us. It's really a focus on the world, the environment, and the objects that we're touching and manipulating. Whereas the passive touch, we're often focused on the sensation, right? The sensation of animal fur rubbing up against the scent, of, uh, against your skin. The sensation, let's say, of your phone vibrating or buzzing in your pocket, right? These are all forms of passive and active touch. And this is something that I encourage you to do, um, you know, with a family or friend, you know, family, friends, or someone else, right? You can take an object. Um, you can even take, you know, a piece of string, for example, and actively touch the string, the string and feel this, you know, the properties of the string, right? And then actually have someone take that same string and rub it over the surface of your skin. And what you'll notice is that in the active situation, you're noticing things about the string or the object that you're touching. Whereas in the passive situation, you're actually just focusing on what does the sensation feel like to be touched? Now, when we think about haptic sensing or touch sensation, we typically group it into two different categories. There's our cutaneous or tactile sensing, and we've used, we've uh, mentioned the word tactile before. And the other category of class is what we call kinesthesia, proprioception, or force sensation. Cutaneous and tactile sensation is related to our skin, and that's because our cutaneous and tactile sensations generally come from sensors that we have, you know, embedded in our skin. And I'll talk about those in a few minutes. Kinesthesia, proprioception, and force sensing come from sensors that we have embedded in our organs, in particular our muscles and tendons, joints, that give us information about our bodily movement and the forces that either our body generates or that are produced or generated on our body. 
So our cutaneous sensing, as I said before, our cutaneous or tactile sensing um, really comes from sensors that are located in our skin. So that's why we say touch again is a distributed sense because everywhere that we have skin, we have touch sensors. So a little bit about our skin. Our skin has an approximate mass of about three to five kilograms. Um, it's actually the heaviest organ in our body. Um, if you were to take the skin and stretch it out, it would, it would cover an approximate area of two meters squared. And it has two main functions. The first is to protect us, right? It keeps everything in, in, and everything out, out, right? It's generally our first line of defense, right? That's why when you get cut, the skin, you know, breaks, it tears, but it also heals. Uh, but then the other thing that touch does, and we've alluded to this already, is that it provides information about the physical stimuli that are presented to our body or that we feel as we explore the world. Skin has two layers, the epidermis and the dermis layer. And there are two different types of skin. There's glabrous skin, and then there's hairy skin. And this, a quick example, glabrous skin would be like the inside of your palm here, whereas hairy skin would be like the backside of your hand here, where hair actually you know, generally grows. And the difference between the glabrous and the hairy actually differ in terms of the density of sensory receptors that are located um, um, in the skin. And then also different sensors are located in the epidermis and dermis layer. So some are located very close to the surface, whereas others are located very deep in the skin. So our skin is very sensitive to mechanical stimuli, right? Um, and that's because we have these sensors that I've been referring to, we often call mechanical receptors. And what they basically do is they take the, the mechanical stimulation um, and turn that into information that can be processed by our nervous system. We also have what we call thermal receptors that measure thermal stimuli and turn that into neural signals that can be processed by our central nervous system. And then, of course, we have what we call obnoxious stimuli, which are things like pain, um, which are sensed by a nociceptors. The mechanical receptors, we have about 500,000 of them throughout our skin, right? Um, and actually about 20,000 of them are in each hand. So if you think about that, right, 4% of our entire set of sensors are in a single hand. And so that's why if you go back to that sensory homunculus, you see why the hands are actually so large, because we have such a dense representation of different types of sensors in our hand that give us all of this information about the world that we're interacting with, and that can measure these mechanical interactions between our body and the world. And again, what they do is they treat, they take these mechanical stimuli, such as someone poking on your skin or dragging on your skin or pressing on the skin or vibrating on the skin, and they re-encode that mechanical information as a neural signal that gets processed by our central, central nervous system and our brain that it helps us coordinate different actions. If we take a cross section of the skin, um, you see here again, you've got different layers of the skin. I mean, what you're seeing here, the, the yellow, green, and uh, purple and blue uh, little illustrations there, those are different types of sensors. And you can see that some are located very near the epidermis or surface layer of the skin, right under the fatty uh, layer of skin. And then others are located down in the dermis, very deep in the skin. Um, these sensors have different names. We refer to them as uh, myosinal corpuscles, Merkel endings, Pacini corpuscles, and Profini endings. Um, you notice they have a, a nomenclature by them that's like FA-1, SA-2, FA-2, SA, you know, what that means is slow adapting, fast adapting, type one, type two. And what that information really tells us is if a sensor is a slow adapting sensor, that means it's really interested in static things, steady state things that don't change, right? So those are the sensors that tell us, oh, I'm touching something and I'm still making contact with that thing. Whereas our fast adapting sensors, the FA, they really tell us about dynamic change, right? Something is touching and not touching or something is vibrating very fast. Um, and so that's the information um, that our, our FA sensors actually uh, tell us. And then the type one and the type two tell us a little bit about where they're located at the surface or deep down in the surface of the skin. They also have different what we call receptive fields, which basically tell us how sensitive they are on the surface of the hand, right? Uh, and so uh, sensors with large receptive fields um, can actually measure a lot of information, whereas sensors with very small receptive fields can actually measure very specific, right? So when you feel someone press a pin against your finger, the pin tip comes from having a very small receptive field. 
They also differ in terms of the range of frequencies of touch that they can um, that they can sense from very slow frequencies, zero to five hertz. So like static touch or things that are moving very slow all the way up to over 500 hertz, things that are moving very fast, like our cell phones vibrate. Um, and so what they sense are different mechanical quant um, different mechanical stimuli, right? The skin being deformed in some way, being compressed in different ways, the skin being vibrated or being stretched. As I mentioned before, we have thermal receptors um, that give us information about thermal information. Now we actually have separate thermal receptors for both warm information and cold information. And the way that these thermal receptors work, our perception of warmth and cold actually comes from a differential between our body temperature and the temperature at the surface of the skin where we're touching the object. Um, and so, um, you know, depending on what your body temperature is, it determines kind of how hot or cold things feel. So uh, an example would be on a very warm, hot day, if you've been outside for a very long time and, and you know, working or playing outside and you walk into a building that has the air conditioning on, the, the air conditioning feels very cold, right? Um, even colder than if you were sitting in the building the entire time. And then if you go in the house or in the kitchen and open up a refrigerator, the cold air blasting from the refrigerator feels very cold. And that's because the differential between our body temperature and the surface temperature at the skin that's having the cold air come across it is very large. So now we'll talk a little bit about kinesthesia. Uh, and remember, I said kinesthesia comes from sensors that are embedded in our muscles and in our tendons. Um, so kinesthesia um, really revolves around our perception of limb movement, limb position, and also force. The receptors are uh, what we call muscle spindles and Golgi tendons. The muscle spindles sit with the muscles in our limbs, um, and, it, and it, it moves with the muscle. As the muscle stretches, as the muscle contracts, the muscle spindle moves as well and lets us know, our body know, how the muscle is changing length, right? So as I open and close my, or move my arm here, right, my muscle spindle is saying, oh, you're actually opening up your arm, or you're closing, or you're flexing your arm. Um, our Golgi tendons actually connect the sit where the muscle and tendon connects to the bone, and they give us information about the forces that the muscles are producing or the forces that are being generated on the muscles themselves. So when you pick up that five or that 10 pound weight, it's the Golgi tendon that's actually giving you a sense of how heavy that object is. We also have receptors. We also have receptors and sensors in our joints, in the capsules and ligaments, um, and then we also have receptors. Our mechanical receptors in our skin tell us something about movement as well. Because every time I move my limbs, my fingers, or my, or, or let's say my arm, the skin has a stretch over the muscle or the joint, and so this amount of stretching tells us something about how the limb uh, moves as well. I want to highlight a term here called proprioception. I mentioned it before. It comes from the Latin root proprius, which means belonging to oneself. And basically what proprioception is, is it's our sense of where we are any given time in space, right? So I know where I am in relation to my keyboard or where I am in relation to the monitor in front of me. Um, I know where this cup of coffee or cup of water is in front of me, but I also know where my body is at any given time, right? I could close my eyes and touch my nose and touch my ears without having to look at it. And that's because I have a sense of self. I know where I am. I know where my left hand is and where my right hand is. And I can bring these two things together without having to look at them. And so that's really helpful for coordinating action. Because if I want to go pick up this cup of coffee in front of me, I first visualize it and localize where it's located. And then I have to say, OK, how far is it from me? Now I know how far I need to actually move my arm in order to reach out and actually make contact with the object. So thinking about making contact with objects, let's just say that you wanted to grab the green ball here, as you see illustrated in front of you. Well, you first look at the ball. Most of our interactions with the physical world are mediated by vision. It's not always true. We can actually operate and manipulate in the world around us without sight. Um, but oftentimes, for sighted individuals, we first localize things with sight. And then we say, okay, if I wanna go reach and grab this green ball, I need to send a series of commands from the brain out to the periphery, to the muscles in my arm that cause my muscles in my arm to contract in order to move my hand to the green ball. At the same time though, we're actively sensing all of this haptic information from the limb that goes back up the spinal column to the brain that's telling us things like, where is your arm? Did your arm reach out to where the green ball is? Did you touch the green ball? And it's helping us course correct and coordinate those movements. 
if we think back to the, the image that I showed at the beginning of all the different types of tasks that we use, it's this tight coordination, right, of the muscle and motor commands going out to the limb and the sensory information coming back from the limb to the brain that helps us perform these tasks, right? Something simple like picking up an egg and not dropping it is actually a really complicated task, right? Hammering a nail into a piece of wood is actually a really complicated task. Tying shoes are actually really complicated tasks, but we're able to do these tasks because of the tight interaction and coordination between our motor commands that go from the brain out to the muscles and our sensory information that goes from the limb back to the brain. So let's take an example here um, uh, and as an illustration of why touch is so important. And this example here is striking a match. And so what you're going to see in this video, and this is a video from the lab of Roland Johansson, um, which is a very interesting and, and similar video um, that I often show, you know, um, whenever I'm giving a talk on what the importance of touch information is, is you'll see this participant take a match out of the matchbox and or out of the box and light it or strike it on the matchbox. Now, what happens now if we take that sensory information and we remove it? And what you're going to see, and I didn't show it here, um, uh, just in case you know you might not like seeing someone stuck with a, a hypodermic needle, um, is local anesthesia was basically applied to the participant's fingertips. This is no different than you know, going to the dentist and having local anesthesia applied, or falling asleep, or you know one of your limbs falling asleep because you maybe slept on it the wrong way or, or sat on it the wrong way. And so it's that numbing, tingling sensation in the hands. And so that's what's done here. Um, so the participant can't actually really get good sensory information from the tank fingertips. And let's see what happens in the same scenario of lighting the match. And so what we see here is that this task, which was seemingly, <clears throat> excuse me, very simple in the beginning, became extremely difficult in the end, not because the person couldn't control their limbs, they had good control over their fingers, but they couldn't feel anything. And so you can see here that touch information is really, really, really important in our ability to do what we call a dexterous fine manipulation tasks. And so it's for that reason that you're actually starting to see uh, touch or haptic uh, uh, applications pop up around us kind of with the advent of the digital world around us and, and digital interfaces. Um, in particular, if you look in the entertainment space, haptic information has largely been prevalent in, uh, in entertainment, whether it's for video games or VR, um, exploring a virtual world. In the education space, haptics is also oftentimes used um, for training purposes. Here in this example, you're seeing uh, a surgical training simulator that's using haptic information to teach surgeons um, how to perform a laparoscopic surgery. But then also in our human computer interfaces, haptics is becoming very widespread with the advent of touch screen. Um, or, you know, an example here, in, uh, for example, in cars, there are certain cars out here that have what they call drive-by-wire systems, where the steering wheel and the steering column doesn't actually connect to the rack and pinion, which causes the wheels to turn. Um, there's actually just a sensor and a digital connection between the two. And so what happens now, the steering wheel is actually connected to a motor that actually replays the sensations that you would normally feel if there were a physical connection between the steering wheel um, and the wheels of the car. <clears throat> Excuse me. Likewise, um, in our consumer electronic devices like smartwatches and computers, haptics is becoming widespread. In most phones now, you can actually control not only the volume of the device, but also the haptic feedback, how it vibrates or how it clicks when you press certain buttons. Um, certain computers now, almost most laptops now, actually don't have a physical mouse pad anymore, especially newer ones. Um, you know, in fact, what happens is when you press the mouse pad, what actually happens is the, the mouse pad actually just vibrates at a very high frequency. that makes it feel as though there's a physical click. And the way you can actually test this out, turn it off. Because the minute you turn it off and there's no power going to the mouse pad, you'll actually notice that when you press on it, it doesn't click anymore. 
And so this is just showing you how haptics is just becoming very widespread as we continue to, to in, you know, interact with not only the physical world, but in, increasingly so the digital uh, and computer world. And so where is haptics going in terms of research? Um, and at this point, I'm going to you know, uh, highlight uh, some of the work uh, that's being done by the students in my lab, the Haptics and Medical Robotics Laboratory um, here at Hopkins. And so I'm going to talk about, um, you know, a lot of work that we're doing in the area of haptic manipulation, in particular through robotic devices. And so let's go back to this image again, which shows, you know, kind of all of the tasks that we can do really well, uh, you know, kind of with our natural limbs using haptic information. Well, there's certain times where we can't interact with the environment in front of us, right? And that's because the environment is either located at great distances from our body, as in the case here of being in outer space, the environment poses dangers or hazards to our body, as in the case of um, explosive ordnance devices. Uh, the, the environment is on a completely different time, a completely different scale, right? We can't physically manipulate carbon nanotube for us, right? Because it's just so small, we can't actually individually manipulate them. Or we've contrived ways of limiting direct access to the environment, as in the case of minimally invasive surgery. Likewise, there are times where the limb itself changes, as in the case of limb loss. And what you're trying to do is restore or, or interact with the environment like you would with your natural intact limbs. And so in both of these scenarios, what we need is an interface that basically takes the action that we want to perform on the environment and carries that action out on the environment on our behalf. We refer to this interface as a teleoperator. Teleoperation has its origins in the, in the 50s and 60s um, when scientists wanted to be able to manipulate radioactive or hazardous material without actually having to physically touch it. And so what you'll see in this, in this video here is uh, one of the original teleoperators invented by a scientist by the name of Raymond Gertz, which was designed to allow scientists to manipulate radioactive material behind a lead glass window. And so as you can see, the, the operator, as we call them, um, was holding these little manipulators, right, that connected through physical links and cables to the set of arms that you see in front of you that were grabbing and manipulating the hazardous material. What's really cool about these original mechanical teleoperators is that there was inherent feedback. So the object, if the operator grabs something um, in what we call the remote environment, which is the environment in front of you, the one with the radioactive material, they could feel it, right? Likewise, if they ran into something, um, as did happen in this video here, you could feel the bump, <clears throat> excuse me, the operator could feel the bump as they were manipulating um, around in the, in the space. Well, with the advent of modern day electronics, including actuators and sensors and computer chips, we move from physical teleoperation to electromechanical telerobots. Now, when we design telerobots, because we have you know, actuators and sensors on them, we can actually measure all of the interactions between the robot and the environment that it's operating in. But unfortunately, a lot of that sensory information that we measure from the environment doesn't get passed back to the operator. And you remember from the match lighting example, when you don't have this haptic information, your ability to do fine level dexterous manipulation really, really, really suffers. And so what researchers like myself um, around the world are doing is figuring out how we can ha add haptic interfaces or touch interfaces into these robotic applications to be able to restore this dexterous uh, manipulation abilities through these robots. And so what I'm going to talk about now um, are in particular different types of haptic interfaces that we've developed in our lab that either A, allow us to fundamentally understand something about touch perception, but also understand or also study how we can add to and develop dexterous manipulation through a telerobot. I'm going to talk about three different types of uh, projects that we do in our lab. The first, again, relates to fundamental haptic perception. The second will be upper limb prosthetics, and then the third will be robotic minimally invasive surgery. The work done in the fundamental haptic perception space uh, is actually done by a former PhD student, now a postdoc in my lab, Dr. Mohit Sengalo. 
So let's just say as a thought exercise, I gave you an orange block and I said, feel this orange block. And you reached out with, let's say your left hand and you grabbed this orange block. And then I said, well, what does it feel like? And you thought about it. Oh, well, maybe it feels rough. Maybe it feels smooth. Maybe it feels heavy. Maybe it feels stiff, right? And then what if I said, okay, now grab that same block with your right hand. What does it feel like? The question becomes, does what it feel like differ between what you felt with your left hand and what you felt with your right hand? That's actually a question that we don't fully understand the answer to. And so what we did is we set out to explore that. So what we what what Dr. Singala did is he built um, a, a single degree of freedom haptic interface that in, consists of a motor with an encoder that allows us to measure the rotary position, how much it's rotating, um, uh, the angle of, it, of its rotation, and a little hand interface to put your hand in. And what we can do uh, with this device um, is present different types of what we call virtual environments, environments that don't, aren't, aren't actually real, but we can make feel real um, by how we program the motor to, <clears throat> excuse me, to respond. And what we did in this case is we built virtual springs. And so a spring kind of in its ideal situation follows what we call Hooke's law, <clears throat> excuse me where the torque output of the spring is proportional to the angular displacement of the spring theta by some constant parameter k. Every spring can generally be, uh, be described by its spring constant k. And so if we modulate that parameter k for the same angular displacement theta, we can get a different torque. And that's what you're gonna see in this video that I'm gonna show. And so what you will see here is that the participant rotates their hand by the same amount and for the same angular displacement, they get a different torque. So what you see is for the same angular displacement, which you see in blue, um, there's a different torque produced by the motor, which you see in red. Oops. So what we did, we built two of these, one for the left hand, one for the right hand. And then we ask participants to basically feel these springs between their two different hands and tell us which of these springs was different. So we use a procedure that's called psychophysics. It was born out of the field of psychology. You, if you've ever gone and gotten your hearing tested, you've likely pr pr participated in the psychophysics uh, experiment where they ask you, did you hear a tone in your left ear, or your right ear? What they're doing is modulating the tone of the uh, sound and you're actually responding and you're building what's called a psychometric curve. And so these psychometric curves basically tell us um, how likely you are uh, to recognize an object or excuse me, be able to differentiate between two different objects. And so in our experiment, what we differentiated between was the stiffness of two different springs. So we gave you two different springs and we asked you which of those two springs was stiffer. And then we, and then we looked at whether the difference between the springs was smaller in your left hand or in your right hand. And what you see here um, on the y-axis is this PS uh, 0 0.75 is saying 75% of the time when you identify which of the springs was stiffer, are the two springs closer together or further apart? And by and large, for this participant here, what you would see is that the springs are actually closer together for the left hand than they are for the right hand, which means the sensitivity was greater in the left hand than the right hand. And so what we found is that, generally speaking, in a right hand dominant participant pool, uh, you are actually more sensitive with your left hand than you are with your right. You can feel the difference between a smaller set of springs with your left hand than you can your right hand. And this is largely true for other types of haptic information. Our ability to perceive shape, right, is also, we're also more sensitive with our left hand if you are right hand dominant than you are with your right hand. Okay, so moving on from fundamental haptic perception, um, we then go into uh, work in the upper limb prosthetic space. Uh, and this is work done uh, by my former PhD student, now postdoc, Dr. Neha Thomas. So if you were to get an amputation today, um, um, you would have two choices in terms of the types of prosthesis um, that you could wear, at least in the upper extremity. A body power prosthesis, which by its name means that it gets power from the body. You usually wear a shoulder harness and a cable to open and close, let's say, the prosthetic hand. 
it operates very much so like the original Gertz teleoperator that I showed in the video a few slides ago. Or you get what's called a myoelectric prosthesis. And in a myoelectric prosthesis, we use the electrical activity of your muscle because every time you contract your muscles, you generate a little small current. We sense that current and we use that to drive a robotic hand. The upside of the body power prosthesis is that it has, just like the Gertz teleoperator, inherent haptic feedback or touch information. Whereas the myoelectric prosthesis doesn't. It doesn't have any haptic information. And so what we've been doing in our research is figuring out what is the benefit of adding this touch information in to a prosthesis? In particular, does it allow us to perform tasks or recognize objects better in the environment? And then does it improve our ability, our mental perception of the objects around us? So we ran an experiment um, where the task, if you see in the top right hand corner, are these three objects that really look very similar, but actually differ in terms of their stiffness, right? There's a hard one, there's a medium stiffness, and then there's a soft stiffness. And we asked participants, in this case, non-amputee participants with our custom prosthesis um, uh, to basically squeeze and feel these objects. And what we did is we measured the grip force, so how hard they were squeezing. We presented that information back to them through an actuator that vibrated on the skin. And then we measured with, if you look in the top left, this little sensor on the forehead, we measured um, the amount of oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood in the prefrontal cortex, which tells us something about mental effort. And so what we were looking for here is a measure of what we call neural efficiency. And neural efficiency basically means um, how much mental effort does it take to get, you know, to basically perform a task at a certain performance level. And ideally what you want is that the performance, the, uh, the task performance increases and the mental effort decreases, that means your neural efficiency increases, right? So high neural efficiency means low mental effort, but high task performance. Whereas low neural efficiency is high mental effort and low task performance. So we said, does adding this haptic feedback in the prosthesis actually give you better neural efficiency? And by and large, we found out the answer was yes. When you have haptic information, which you see in the middle column here, you do significantly better than when you don't have the haptic information, which you see in the right hand column, which the yellow polka dot. It's still not as good as the intact hand, right? What we can do with our natural limbs, um, but it's definitely significantly better than what we can do when we don't have haptic information in our prosthesis. So very quickly, moving on to the work we've been doing in the robotic minimally invasive surgery space. Uh, and this is work done by my PhD student, uh, Sergio Mashaka. Um, one of the you know, most common surgical robotic devices um, is the Da Vinci device, which in the bottom left, you see the participants' hands using these little manipulators. They control the robotic instruments that are actually inside the patient's body performing the surgical procedure. This device is really good at giving surgeons really precise control ability over these surgical instruments. But unfortunately right now, there's no haptic information. So surgeons can't actually feel what's going on inside the patient's body with the instruments and the patient's tissue. But yet when you talk to surgeons all the time, they will say things like, oh, I don't, you know, it, I don't notice I don't have haptic feedback. I can feel with my eyes. And so we started to think a little bit about this, uh, uh, what we call feeling with this, uh, feeling with your eyes or this visual haptic acuity, the ability to recognize haptic information through your visual sense. And just like any skill, right, it takes time to develop. And so what we wanted to know, because most of the surgeons that say I can feel with their eyes, they've done hundreds, if not thousands of surgical procedures. Can we speed that process up for novice trainees to be able to learn or develop this visual haptic acuity at a faster rate? And so what we decided is, well, if we give surgeons who are watching these procedures the ability to also feel what's going on through haptic feedback, maybe what they learn by seeing and feeling, if we once we remove the haptic feedback, their visual sense has now developed this visual plus haptic information. And so we tested this out by developing an a interface that, where we can put a training task, like this peg transfer training task, on top of a force sensor, measure all of the interaction forces as the participant or the surgeon does the training task. And then we map that information to this little device, which squeezes on your wrist in proportion to how much force you're pressing on the task board with. You can see in this case here, um, as the participant is doing the task, the device is moving all around um, are squeezing and tightening and loosening around their wrists. And so we ran an experiment and we said, well, what happens now if we add haptic information in, 
right? And so we basically did an experiment where it had three phases. In the first phase, participants didn't have haptic information. In the second phase, we gave them the haptic feedback. And then in the third phase, we turned it off. And by and large, what we found is that everybody started at some baseline level of performance. And here we're just measuring how much force they actually produce on the task material. Um, and it's generally pretty high. When we turn the haptic information on, their forces drop significantly. But what's really interesting is that when we turn the haptic feedback off again, right, simulating what actually happens in a real surgical procedure, their performance of the forces that they produce didn't go back up. So somehow they're taking this haptic information and they're using that to adjust in their visual information, what they recognize and learning how to incorporate that information to still be able to produce low forces, even though we weren't giving them the happening information all the time. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up really quickly and just kind of remind you again, why is haptic so important? Um, I've used this image now a number of times, but I think I wanna drive home the importance that like haptic information is so important for controlling our dexterous manipulation, our ability to do the spine level manipulation, reminding you that most of our interactions actually involve our hands, right? Which is why there's an outsized number of sensory receptors um, in our hands. And then what we're doing in, in, in from a research perspective is figuring out how do we enable or how do we engineer that sense of touch into robotic interfaces so that you maintain that same level of haptic information or be able to do that dexterous level of performance. So with that, I will stop again acknowledging all of the students in my lab who've done this um, outstanding work. Um, and then uh, as time allows, I will take questions, um, uh, any questions that you, you may have. So thank you. Okay, so I see a couple of questions coming in. Okay, so one of the questions is, um, over the last, uh, over the past few years, we've had a lot of AI algorithms learn to identify objects and pictures. Is there work being done in the same vein around touch? Yes, there is. Um, there are a number of different research efforts going on right now, trying to figure out the same approaches that have been working in the touch domain using um, uh, you know, uh, computer vision to say, can we actually recognize objects through touch? Um, uh, you know, whether it's under, you know, training robots or AI algorithms to understand touch, right? So when I say something is slippery, what does that actually mean? Or if I say something is rough, what does that actually mean? And so there's a lot of work going on in space of like, how do you, how do, you do that? Um, how do you build sensors that can recognize that information um, and, that, and that touch information? Um, and, and even in the work that we're doing kind of in the prosthetic space, trying to figure out how do you, how do you enable um, you know, uh, a prosthesis to become a little bit more intelligent and understand something. So if, so if, the, uh, if the amputee is using the prosthesis to let's say pick up a glass that has water on it or condensation on the outside, it knows now that that object is a little bit more slippery and it's, it's more prone to slip. Maybe it can take that information and now use that to help the amputee better control the amount of grip force that's being, uh, that's being done. And so that's some work that we're doing in our lab, but that's work that's going on kind of broadly speaking, um, you know, in terms of being able to enable or endow, you know, robotic devices um, with this a level of intelligence around understanding uh, touch information and how you utilize this touch information um, in order to do better fine level manipulation. So another question is, do different types of engineered touch use different types of sensors? Yes. And so that's what actually makes haptics research so challenging, right? Most, you know, when you think about like vision or audition, right, you're basically sending the same information or you're sending all of your visual information to the eyes, right? Or all of your auditory information to the ears. But depending on what I'm trying to do and the type of information that I'm trying to give you, I have to specifically target different types of mechanical receptors in the skin or different, let's say, sensors embedded in the muscles. So if I want you to feel, let's say, the texture of an object, what I really need to stimulate are the Pacini and corpuscle um, mechanical receptors located in your skin, which are the primary mechanical receptors responsible for sensing vibration, right? And most of our touch information, uh, our texture information, a lot of it, especially if you're inter interacting through an, eye, an object like a stylus, is encoded in uh, vibration. Uh, and so I need to basically stimulate that sensor particularly. Right. If I if I want to stimulate skin stretch, right, then I need to actually think about maybe the Ruffini endings, uh, because that's telling me like, you know, if I'm an example would be holding a pen and somebody pulling the pen out of my hand. When I 
feel that object stretching, right, as it's trying to slip out of my hand, that information is going specifically to the Ruffini end. And so, yes, we are specifically targeting different types of, we, you know, we, we typically target different types of mechanical stimuli, knowing that the mechanical receptors are generally there to sense that information. But it all really depends on the type of task um, that we're doing. Another question is, um, you know, how much of, of success is based on the sensitivity of the sensor versus the program or the algorithm um, uh, which interprets it? <laughs> You know, I, that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, and I think it's a little bit of both. And this is something that haptics researchers are challenged with all the time. I can present the right information to you, but your ability to interpret that information actually determines how successful you're gonna be. Um, and so it's a little bit of a balance between the two. Um, you know, too much information may actually overload the system. Not enough information may actually not be enough to actually get the, thing, get the task done. But if you think about it, as humans, we are very adept at taking any piece of information that we receive and using that information to do a task, right? Something as simple as your phone, right? Depending on how it vibrates, you already know whether somebody's sending you a text message, whether somebody's calling you, or other types of notifications that you have, right? Um, and that's because we've learned to encode these patterns of vibration as meaning different things. Um, and so that's an, an example of how even let's say uh, um, limited information can actually be used to do complicated tasks. Um, so it really depends on, it, it depends on a little bit of both. And oftentimes as researchers, the scientific question that we're answering is just that. How much information do you need to be able to get the task done? What's the minimum amount? And then if we add a little bit more, does it make it better or does it actually make it worse now because you have more information that you need to pay attention to and we're sometimes overloading the system? Another question is, um, are these uh, similar to interfaces used by patients controlling computer cursors with brain interfaces? Um, so yeah, so a, in, in some ways, right? So what you're talking about is a brain computer interface where they're taking signals out of the brain. Oftentimes they can do it non-invasively through approaches like uh, um, EEG, electroencephalography. Um, that works very similar to EMG, electromyography, where basically the brain has neural circuits that conduct electricity. You can sample that electrical signal and use that with the decoding algorithm to be able to control a, sense, a, a cursor moving over a screen. You can also invasively go in um, you know, with an electrode and sample from the, you know, the cortex and be able to pick up those signals even more reliably. The same thing works with EMG. Um, EMG on the surface level um, takes the electrical uh, um, you know, signals that are generated when we contract the muscle and we basically map that signal to, uh, let's say, a controller and an amplifier that drives a, a motor. You can also invasively go in um, with an electrode and actually target directly the muscle um, to get that signal out. But they work on very similar principles. Um, although, you know, the, the, the details are, are, are different, um, but overlying the principles are, are exactly the same. I mean, in fact, you can take an EMG signal and use that to also control a cursor on a screen. It's just all about how you decode the information and then re-encode it in whatever interface you're trying to use it for. Um, where can you learn, uh, what, a question is where can I go to learn more about these projects? So actually, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen that um, I have up, that's a little QR code that will literally take you right to my lab's website. Um, and so you can go there, um, see examples, read papers from our lab. Uh, it also has my contact information. If you wanted to learn more, I'd be happy to point you in the right direction of you know, re either research that we've done or research that, that some of my amazing colleagues around the world are doing in the haptic space. Um, so learning a skill, another question, learning a skill is sometimes referred to as muscle memory. Any words on that? How does muscle memory relate to the sense of touch? So it's interesting, right? So when people say muscle memory, um, you know, muscle memory is sort of a loaded term that actually incorporates a lot of sensory information, right? So if you think about if you if you've ever played a sport, right, or played an instrument, um, you know, strumming the, you know, the, the, the strings on a guitar, or playing the note or playing the keys on the piano, swinging the tennis racket. Um, people will often say, oh, you know, when you get really good at it, muscle memory takes over. But the reason muscle memory takes over, if you've ever, let's say, swung a racket and hit the ball really well, oftentimes what you say is, oh, that felt right. 
Um, and that's because this muscle memory actually means a, a lot of it is actually encoded in our sensory information as well, right? We know how to move the limbs, but we are also measuring how we use, how we move the limbs as well. They gave us, right, the type of performance that we want. Um, and so it's really this, again, thinking about both the muscle information that's going out to the limbs, but the sensory information that's coming back from the limbs that really kind of encapsulates this quote unquote muscle memory that we that you often hear talked about. Uh, another question, uh, let's say thinking of VR examples, um, how successful are we at uh, reverse engineering textures in touch senses, say producing the feeling of sand in a haptic glove or something? We're actually getting really good at it. In fact, um, there's a company called Haptics um, that makes a glove specifically for VR that I had the fortune of trying out a few weeks ago because they were doing a demo um, here on campus. Um, they've gotten really good at being able to reproduce some of these touch sensations, right? Um, having actuators that press on the skin um, that give us a sensation, maybe not of sand, because sand is so granular, um, but maybe something like raindrops, where you can feel the raindrops hitting the surface of your hand. We're getting better. And as our actuator technology increases um, and our ability to miniaturize these actuators, because that's actually what the, one of the limiting factors is, um, our ability to miniaturize these, these actuators and things so they produce sensations in a very, very narrow region. Um, we will get even better at being able to reproduce some of these sensations. Um, what's actually also interesting about the VR space is that sometimes you can actually fool participants in VR um, by actually giving them real sensations, right? So I could have you put on a VR hand, headset and, um, you know, and put you in an environment where you're reaching out and grabbing sand. And what I can actually do is because you have a VR headset on and you can't actually see the world around you, is I can put a physical box of sand in front of you and actually map your hand position to the virtual hand position so that what you're actually feeling um, is the sand itself. And that's, um, um, you know, what that's, that's called haptic augmentation or haptic redirecting. Um, and you can see examples of that in the literature where people have used real physical examples to give you the sense of touch in a virtual environment. Um, let's see, uh, I think I've got two more questions. Uh, one is, do you think we'll reach a point where we can have a full body haptic suit that can simulate any type of haptic feedback? I think we will get there in an approximate sense. Um, We've got so many sensors throughout our body, right? And, 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 and I'm definitely one who thinks that that would be really amazing. I mean, I've you know, um, read the Ready Player One series, right? And so I know, you know I, um, this idea of a full haptic suit just is like really, really, really cool. Um, one of the limiting factors, again, that I mentioned in the last example with the VR is that are we're struggling to minimize, um, you know, the actuators that we wear uh, on our on our bodies in order to be able to stimulate individual mechanoreceptors um, like we get from the world around us. Um, I think we will get closer. I don't know if we'll actually get 100 percent there, but we may not have to, because, again, remember, we don't always need all of the information to be able to. Um, you know, to to still do something or experience the, the uh, you know these virtual world. I mean, many people are operating in virtual virtual reality right now without any haptic information, right? So imagine now if we add just a little bit more and then a little bit more and a little bit more. I think it will only make the experience that much better. Um, even if we never get to, you know to having this full haptic suit that can simulate any type of haptic information. Um, and then the last question, um, is there any evidence that visual haptic acuity in the visually impaired people are better, uh, in, excuse me, in visually impaired people are better than normal? I mean, would they, you know, by that, do they depend on tact tactile sense all the time? And so does that get better over time? The answer is yes. So people who have visual impairment, they've actually done studies on the brain. Um, the, um, you know, over time, because they've had to rely almost exclusively, depending on the level of impairment, on their touch sensation, their brain actually starts to do a remapping. And areas of the brain that usually lit up for visual information now start to light up when they're actually touching things. So it shows that the brain is actually remapping itself over time um, in order to give more brain resources to processing and understanding the world of touch than vision because you're not getting as much information through the visual sensors, the eyes in this case. Okay, um, so with that, 
I'm going to wrap right up. It's right at one o'clock. Um, I thank you again for tuning in uh, to Hopkins at Home. I hope that I was able to at least, uh, um, you know, share with you my passion for the sense of touch and why I think touch is so cool and such a fascinating thing to study. Um, please, you know, do visit uh, uh, our lab's website. Reach out to me if you have further questions. I would be happy to answer it. And I hope you tune in. Uh, to the next uh, Hopkins at Home episode, which will be airing, you know, um, at some point later in the future. Thank you and have a good day.